Questions without notice. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you. Uh, my question is to the Prime Minister. The Australian Bureau of Statistics confirms that company profits have increased by 5.8 per cent over the year, nearly three times as much as wages growth of 2.1 per cent. So why does this Prime Minister support arbitrarily cutting the penalty rates of working Australians this Sunday while he's giving an $80 billion handout to big business? Or is this just another case of the Prime Minister telling nearly 700,000 hard-working Australians who are again having their penalty the rates arbitrarily to cut to just get a concluded. better job? The Prime Minister has the call. Yes, yes thank you, Mr Speaker. Well, Mr Speaker, I can understand, well understand the desperation of the Leader of the Opposition, <laughs> faced as he is with a challenge from the member for Grainler, <laughs> who has laid out his wares, laid out his wares, reminded everybody that there was a time when the Labor Party stood for aspiration, stood to encourage people to get ahead. It was a party which talked about opportunity. And the member for Grainler was out there with the most pre-brief political speech any of us can remember. Any of us can remember. You couldn't move in the press gallery, Mr. Speaker. There were so many people working for the member for Grainler, pushing through the pushing through the crowds to get copies of that speech out there. And you know what, Mr. Speaker? It's a speech that would have been completely unremarkable in normal times because it talked about great Labor leaders. It even talked about a great Liberal leader, John Carrick. It talked about the importance of hard work. It decried class war and the politics of envy. And who was it aimed at? The Leader of the Opposition. That's what it was all about. And so now, having been chastised by his rival, the member for Grainler, what does he do? He goes even further to the left with one personal attack after another. Well, Talks about, he talks about penalty rates. He talks about Members penalty rates. Left. Let's, uh, let's uh, talk about clean events. Hey, what about that? They had a penalty rate of $50 an hour under the award. They did, $50 an hour. Well, the Leader of the Opposition, that champion of the poor and oppressed, now, that battling advocate for the workers, he traded it down to $18 an hour. $18 an hour. Well, you know what? My old friend Neville Ram used to say, anyone can go to jail if they get the right lawyer. But I'd say this, anyone can get their penalty, penalty rates hard if they have the Leader of the Opposition representing them. The member for Robertson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Will the Prime Minister outline to the House why it is important to encourage employment through lower taxes and not attack those in the economy who create jobs? And is the Prime Minister aware of any alternative approaches? The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you. I thank the honourable member for a question. And Mr Speaker, our plan for a stronger economy is delivering record jobs growth. Last year, last year, 2017, the highest jobs growth in Australia's history ever, the best jobs growth we've ever seen, and we have 3.1 per cent GDP growth. So we're delivering more jobs and stronger economic growth. And that means Member for you get stronger government revenues, which means we can bring the budget back into balance a year earlier. It means we can provide tax relief to hard-working Australian families so they can keep more of the money they earn. It's their money. Of course, the Labor Party think it's the government's money. The Labor Party has a completely different perspective on hard-working Australians' earnings. They see any tax relief as a giveaway. It's a giveaway. The government is giving money away. Well, it's not, Mr. Speaker. Australians work hard. They are facing rising costs of living. They want to get ahead, and they want to be able to keep more of the money they earn. And thanks, thanks to the stronger economy, to the stronger jobs growth, to the keen economic management of the government that is ensuring the government funds all of those essential services we need. 
all of them with increasing amounts every year and at the same time lives within its means, we are able to provide vital tax relief to hard-working Australian families, supporting enterprise, encouraging aspiration, encouraging Australians to get ahead, ensuring that not only do middle-income families have more money in their pocket from their money, they're keeping more of the money they've earned next year, but through the whole reform plan. We get to a point where we have 94 per cent of Australians paying no more than 32 and a half cents in every extra dollar they earn. This is a massive reform. Now, of course, the alternative from the Labor Party is one that is designed to demonise anyone that wants to get ahead. Today, the Leader of the Opposition talked about wanting to uh, encourage people to get ahead who earned, he went, 40, 60, 80, $100,000. Well, anyone on $100,000 today is going to be massively worse off under the Labor Party were they allowed to implement their tax scheme. And there's no doubt about that. Labor has turned its back on aspiration. It has embraced the politics of envy and a class war, and the member for Graindler has called it out. He has called it out. The challenge has begun. Winter, we may the be getting to the end Prime of winter, Minister's but the member for Graindler. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. When the Prime Minister visited a cafe this morning, did he apologise to the workers who served him his coffee for supporting cuts to their penalty rates? At the same time, he's giving an $80 billion handout to big business. Or is it one rule for the businesses the Prime Minister invests in and another for the workers who serve him? Members on my right, the Minister for Health, the Minister for Urban Infrastructure, the Prime Minister has the call. I thank the Honourable Member for a question and remind her, remind her that just as supporting enterprise and supporting hard-working families getting ahead was always part of the Labor Party's ethos for over a century, but now abandoned by her and her leader. Oh, look, the Labor Party has abandoned us. Any deputy Labor leader that can say aspiration is a mystery to her has lost touch with what the Labor Party used to be all about. And, Mr Speaker, another thing the Labor Party was founded on was the need to have an independent umpire. An independent umpire. That was William the Guthrie Member Spence, for Bruce. founder of the AWU, going right back into the 19th century. That was always the goal, an independent umpire. And in one form or another, it's been part of our landscape for over a century. And what we have here, we have take the Leader of the Opposition. He said a couple of years ago, he said, I know that for the last 110 years, conciliation and arbitration, the ability to have an honest broker, at the end of the day, hear the complaints, hear the concerns and hear the appeals is what give the workers a voice. Well, the Fair Work considered the, the matter of penalty rates. It heard everybody, all the parties, and it made a decision. It wasn't an arbitrary decision. It was the decision of the independent umpire. But of course, Mr Speaker, if you talk about arbitrary decisions, what about the way in which unions, in particular the union formerly led by the Leader of the Opposition, traded away one set of penalty rates after another, and all too often did so at, in return for payments by the employer to the union, which were not disclosed. Were not disclosed. And when this shocking state of affairs was revealed in the Hayden Royal Commission, and we introduced legislation to do no more than require unions to reveal payments they had from employers to their members, who opposed it? The Labor Party. The Labor Party has abandoned the workers. It's abandoned its values. The mystery of aspiration to the deputy leader of the opposition has not left the Labor Party anywhere but utterly out of touch with the people it was once founded to represent. No wonder the member for Graindler has had a gutful of his leader. 
The member for Moore. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer update the House on the importance of encouraging and rewarding aspiration through the government's personal income tax cuts? And is the Treasurer aware of any alternative views that would undermine aspiration? The Treasurer has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member for more for his question. This year's budget was a plan for a stronger economy, and that plan is working. More than a million jobs have been created since we were first elected. We had record jobs growth last year, Mr. Speaker. Economic growth through the year 3.1 per cent, back up on top of all advanced economies in the world today. And a key part of that plan for a stronger economy, which is working and we need to stick to, is lower taxes. Lower taxes to ensure businesses are more competitive, and lower taxes to ensure that Australians who go to work today, today and every day and go and pay their taxes have the incentive to keep going and doing that. Our plan for personal taxes is that they be lower, that they be fairer, and that they be simpler. And now they are legislated, Mr. Speaker. They have been legislated by this parliament, so all Australians who are working and paying taxes today and in the future can go into this next decade, a decade where there is a plan for a stronger economy and also a decade where they know that they will be paying less tax than they otherwise would be. And what that says to families and what that says to people who are going Member out there lives. and working hard, Mr Speaker, is that they can plan for their future with confidence. We have laid out a long-term plan. So they know where as a government we're going, and we've got the backing of this parliament to ensure that that plan is in place. So they have the incentive, so they have the reward, and that they have, Mr. Speaker, the opportunity to go and realise those, those plans of theirs. People who have plans, Mr. Speaker, have aspirations. That's what they have. They have aspirations for themselves, for their families, Mr. Speaker, and they have those plans. And what we have done by ensuring that our personal tax ban has been legislated is that they can give effect to their aspiration now and they can set themselves on that course and they can have that encouragement. That plan that deals firstly with lower and middle income earners. That plan that then deals with bracket creep. That plan that deals with a simpler tax system, which means that 94 per cent of Australians will not pay a marginal tax rate greater than 32 and a half cents in the dollar. Now, if we had not done that, if we had not legislated that, that figure would have been 63 per cent, Mr Speaker. And that, what that would have meant is a paramedic today working and earning around $80,000, not only will they get $530 back on their tax refund, they will get $3,740 better off over the next seven years. And importantly, that paramedic will never face a tax rate at a marginal rate of 32.5 cents or more. 32.5 cents will be as much as they will pay under the plan that we've had legislated, but not under the plan of those opposite. Under the Labor Party, that paramedic will face a 37 cent tax rate. They will pay higher taxes. And what the Leader of the Opposition is telling Australians is he wants to put $70 billion of higher taxes, vote Labor, pay more tax. That's his message. That's not the message of this government. The member for Canberra. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Prime Minister. Company profits increased by 5.8 per cent over the year, nearly three times as much as wages. So why does this Prime Minister support cutting the penalty rates of nearly 700,000 working Australians by up to $77 a week, while he's giving an $80 billion handout to big business? Or is the Prime Minister telling hard-working Australians, including those who made his coffee this morning, to just get a better job too? The Prime Minister has the call. Well, I, I thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, uh, the, uh, the, honourable member, the honourable member overlooks the fact that the champion in trading away penalty rates is none other than her leader. Nobody. Nobody has been more consistent in trading away penalty rates than her leader. And he did so, he did so in return for in return for secret negotiations with the employer. That's it. That's it. The independent umpire which the Labor Party was founded to support and maintain, which was being lauded and praised and defended by the Labor Party again and again. I mean, at one point, uh, at one point, uh, 
the Leader of the Opposition in the last election said that he was going to throw himself foot bodily, you know, he was going to do everything he could to uh, stop the government abolishing the fair work, the independent umpire. But we had no more plans to do that than we did of selling Medicare. It was another Labor scare. But, but the reality is this. The, the member for Bruce is, is warned. He says, he says only Labor uh, can be trusted to stand up for the independent umpire. Well, now they want to junk the independent umpire. You can't have it both ways. You can't support an independent umpire and then abandon it, disown it when it makes decisions the that you Lindsay. don't agree with. The Leader of the Opposition sold out workers on one agreement after another. The most notorious case was Clean Event, where the overtime award rate was $50 an hour, and he negotiated it down, negotiated it down to $18 an hour. And after the, uh, the Leader of the Opposition left the uh, union to come into parliament, clean event in order to maintain the arrangements for the AWU in Victoria, paid the union $75,000, un undisclosed to the members of the union. And when we wanted to ensure that members knew what was going on and introduced legislation to apply a bit of sunlight, who opposed it? The Labor Party. They have abandoned the very people for whom the Labor Party was founded to protect. No wonder the member for Grainler is disgusted with this turn of events. No wonder the member for Grainler has set out his challenge, a return to the values of Tom Uren and the Labor Party in challenging the pathetic class war and hypocrisy of the Leader of the Opposition. The member for Melbourne. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for the Environment and Energy. Huge advances in renewable energy and storage technology mean that the electricity sector can more easily cut its pollution than agriculture or transport can. Yet, despite demanding that states and territories compromise and agree to your national energy guarantee, you yourself have refused to compromise on the poultry emissions reductions target set for electricity. In fact, you even want to lock it in and tie the hands of future governments for 10 years. Given your refusal to negotiate in good faith on the pollution target for electricity and to thus make other sectors do the heavy lifting, can you now tell the House what are the government's emissions reduction targets now for agriculture and transport? The Minister for the Environment and Energy. <coughs> well, Mr Speaker, we won't take a lecture from the Greens right. who call Senator Jim Mullen a war criminal, Mr Speaker. Right. We won't take a lecture from the Greens who are celebrating when people's houses are burnt down and blaming it on climate change, Mr right. Speaker. Now, the reality is that emissions on a per capita and GDP basis are now their lowest in 20 eight years, Mr Speaker. That's the record of the Turnbull government, and we've done it without a carbon tax. We've done it without a citizens' assembly. We've done it without a cash for clunkers, Mr Speaker. We have delivered lower emissions in electricity and in other areas, Mr Speaker. Now, when it comes to renewables, we have seen a record investment in renewables under the Turnbull government. Australia is now the third most attractive destination in the world on a per capita basis for investment in renewables and the seventh most attractive de destination over overall in the world, Mr Speaker. At the same time, we will not compromise the affordability and the reliability of our power system. The Greens and the Labor Party want to shut down our coal-fired power stations across the country and sell out the blue-collar workers in the member for Hunter's electorate. He wants to sell out the workers across his electorate the in the Minister member for, for Shortland. He wants to sell out the, the Member for Melbourne on a point of order. Since the question was about targets for agriculture and transport, and the minister the could member address for, those. Member for Melbourne uh, will resume his seat. The minister will just wait. I'm going to rule on the point of order, if that's okay with him. Uh, I'm going to make two points um, uh, to the member for Melbourne. Members, members, member for Mallee and others will cease interjecting. Certainly, the last part of the mem member for Melbourne's question was about those uh, uh, two specific policy areas of agriculture and transport. The problem for the chair, of course, is um, the preambles to questions that ministers are in 
title to address, and in the case of independence questions, they tend to be lo longer, given the longer time limit they have for their questions of 45 seconds. That's beyond my control. I've made that point uh, on numerous occasions. But I do say to the Minister for Energy and Environment, none of the preamble or the specific questions from the member for Melbourne, I was about to intervene, relate to the opposition. So he needs to confine himself to the question. <laughs> Speaker, in relation, to the, in relation to the land sector, the Emissions Reduction Fund has reduced emissions and contracted for emissions for 190 million tonnes, Mr Speaker, at an average cost of around $13 a tonne—a very effective pressure, a very effective, effective policy, Mr Speaker. And when it comes to the transport sector, we've invested through the Clean Energy Finance Corporation in electric vehicles and the rollout of emissions there. But, Mr Speaker, when it comes at the end of the day, to reducing emissions, we will also ensure the affordability and the stability of our energy system. We've committed to 26 to 28 per cent, and we're, just as we achieve overachieving on our 2020 target, we'll meet our 2030 target too. The member for Petrie. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Infrastructure and Transport. Will the Deputy Prime Minister please update the House on how the government is backing hard-working families, small and family businesses, through infrastructure investment, including in my electorate of Petrie? And is the Deputy Prime Minister aware of any roadblocks to jobs and economic growth for regional and outer metropolitan Australia? The Deputy Prime Minister has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for Grainler is very noisy today. He's very noisy late last week, too, probably with good reason. But Australians work hard. Australia, there he goes again. Australians work hard, and Liberals and Nationals back them. Jobs, tax relief, aspiration. That's right. This is what the government is all about. It's what the member for Petrie is all about, and we are delivering. It doesn't matter where you live, whether you're paying income tax or company tax as a small business. We have your back. We want, to make it, we want to make it easier for you. The member for Petrie is a passionate advocate for the people in his electorate in the outer suburbs of Brisbane. and He understands the unique and important role that regional Australia plays in our economy. He's part of a government which put those people first, put those people first with income tax last week. People in Petrie, people in Proserpine, people in Peak Hill in my electorate, people in Parramatta, people in Port Adelaide. They're the people we want to put first in our once-in-a-generation income tax relief. From 1 July, low- and middle-income earners will start to see the benefits of tax relief as the new financial year starts. We know that these Australians in our suburbs and in our regions are needing the tax relief the most, and we are the government who is delivering it. We've delivered it. People such as Danny L from Bald Hills in the members' electorate. As a young worker, she will be one of the first to see and reap the benefits from the tax relief. She can help pay her bills that much easier and maybe even have a little bit left over to spend in her local economy. The member for Petrie ran a small family business before his election, and he backs the millions of Australians who work in these type of businesses each and every day. He knows how hard it is to run a small family business. He understands it. I know you, you people opposite don't, but he does, and he wants to make it easier for them, Mr Speaker. Families and small businesses need infrastructure investment to help them grow too. In outer Melbourne, in outer metropolitan, sorry, and rural and regional areas, investments such as the Bruce Highway upgrade, the Deception Bay Road Interchange upgrade, $13 million in roads to recovery funding and the budget commitment to the Beer Barham to Nambour Rail Line. Team Queensland is very much behind that project. They'll benefit from the people uh, for the people of Petrie. This is delivered thanks to the good economic management of the Liberals and Nationals, the Turnbull government. Yet we compare this track record with that of those opposite. That of those opposite, it's not a pretty sight. It ain't, it's not a pretty sight. When we cut income tax for every working Australian, Labor said no. When we helped deliver historic small business tax cuts, Labor said no. When we helped create a million jobs in five years, what did Labor do? Sat on its hands, sat on its hands, said no. The people of Petrie, people of Crosspine, people of Peak Hill, they know that Labor is opposed. They know that to, get it, to them getting ahead. They know the leader of the opposition is the biggest roadblock to their success, and they know that the member for Grainler knows it too. 
The member for Isaacs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. I refer to reports the Prime Minister will personally benefit from his $80, million, $80 billion handout to big business through his investments in dozens of big businesses. Can the Prime Minister confirm that through at least 15 of his 39 managed funds, he invests in 18 businesses that have a turnover of more than $50 million and an additional 14 businesses that have a turnover of more than a billion per year? Can the Prime Minister confirm how much these dozens of big businesses will benefit from his big business tax handout? The Prime Minister has the call. Well, I thank the honourable member for his question. As uh, I've described to uh, honourable members before, Australians know my life story. It's hardly a secret. Uh, now, uh, over the course of my life, uh, Lucy and I have worked hard. We've had good fortune, uh, and we have uh, paid tax, paid a lot of tax. Uh, we've given back to the community, and we have been able. To Members on my left, a great deal, a great deal. And there was a time when uh, the Labor Party would have certainly uh, welcomed that. Many Australians seek to work hard. Most Australians, vast majority of Australians, seek to work hard and get ahead. And uh, when they do, they pay their tax. They contribute to the society. Uh, historically, both sides of politics have welcomed that, but apparently not any longer. Now, the honourable members asked about uh, my investments, which are set out in the members' interests disclosure. As honourable members would be aware, and I've explained why I've done this in the past, the funds are managed Member by an McEwen. external financial adviser. Uh, they are, the liquid investments in securities are overwhelmingly held in managed funds, uh, and they are uh, almost entirely offshore managed funds. Uh, I don't have, I, for the, reason, the reason for that is so as to avoid conflicts of interest in Australian shareholders. Uh, so that is, uh, that's, that is the situation. Uh, if the honourable members opposite want to start a politics of envy campaign about it, I don't think they'll be telling people the for anything they don't know. But I just remind, I would just remind, I would just remind Member honourable McMahon. members opposite that virtually every member of this House who has interests in Australian superannuation funds, uh, and I'd particularly note uh, Australian super being one that is very uh, well supported or patronised by members opposite, has investments in all of the big uh, multinationals, all of the big companies and banks and so forth. So the idea that uh, the honourable member wants to create that somehow or other my wife and I are in a special, <coughs> unique position in terms of our shareholdings is absolutely wrong. Now, but by all means, the honourable members opposite should go ahead with it if they wish. But I have to say that the politics of envy is one that has failed in the past. Labor leaders with success have united Australians and have called on Australians to be optimistic, to be ambitious, to look forward and to aspire. Australian Labor leaders who have been successful have talked the about the Prime value Minister's time that the member for Grain was The member for Karangabar. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Revenue and Financial Services. Will the Minister update the House on why it is important to have tax policies that reward hard work? Is the Minister aware of any threats to the hip pockets of working Australians? The Minister for Revenue and Financial Services. I thank the member for Karangamite for her question. She, like those on this side of the chamber, understands that Australians work hard for their money and they should keep as much of that hard-earned income as possible. They understand on this side of the chamber, as we do as a government, that it is not the government's money, it is the individual's money. And that is why I am happy to note here in this chamber the government's historical personal income tax plan that allows individuals to keep more of their hard-earned income that they work for, whilst also guaranteeing 
the essential services that Australians rely on. Because, of course, our plan delivers lower, simpler and fairer taxes for all Australians, principles that we on this side agree with, and the contrast with those opposite could not be clearer. They are for higher, bigger and more taxes. That is something that unites every single one of them, perhaps, perhaps with the exception of one. Maybe I am being a little unkind in tarring all of those opposite with the same brush. Maybe there is one amongst them who dares to speak out and dares to be different. And I just want to highlight the member for Graindler. Of course, the member for Graindler, he is so aspirational. He last Friday broke ranks with those opposite and said that Labor should celebrate the importance of individual enterprise and the efforts and the importance of the business community. Now, I kept reading through his speech, and I'm a little sad to say that there wasn't terribly much more that I could agree with, um, because, of course, he talked about the fact that the Labor Party is not a single issue party. But, of course, the Labor Party is a single issue party. It is the party of higher taxes. This is, in fact, something that motivates them. This is something that they truly believe in. And let's consider the evidence. Labor will raise taxes for small business, small business and family enterprise. They are going to raise those taxes for those people who want to earn or who aspire to earn more than $90,000, they will pay higher taxes under the Labor Party. They will increase taxes for those people who have got superannuation accounts and investments. And if you happen to survive the tax tsunami that those opposite would like to wreak upon the Australian people, when you retire, they will come after you as well and they will deny you your tax refunds. It all adds up to more than $200 billion worth of new or increased taxes. They are going to hit Australians, young or old, because they believe in higher taxes. The government knows that the income earned by those Australians who work hard for their income deserve to keep as much of it as possible. Those opposite, those opposite would deny the it to them. The minister's time has concluded. The member for Chifley. Speaker, my question is to the Prime Minister. Last week, the government told 8,000 workers losing their job at Telstra that, quote, these things do happen. But this week, the Prime Minister is doing everything he can to give big business, including Telstra and the banks, an $80 billion tax handout. A week after they sacked 8,000 workers and in the middle of the Banking Royal Commission, why is the Prime Minister awarding Telstra and the big banks and punishing workers? Members on my right, the member for McKellar, the member for McKellar, will cease interjecting. The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Cutting the company income tax rate increases domestic productivity and domestic investment. More capital means higher productivity and economic growth, and leads to more jobs and higher wages. Member for Maribyrnong, Tuesday, 23rd of August, 2011. <laughs> As Australia is buffeted by economic events overseas, we understand that lowering corporate tax assists the creation of jobs. What can be more important in this country than the creation of jobs? Member for Maribyrnong, Wednesday, 14th of March, 2012. We recognise that in a world of mobile capital, if we have higher company tax rates, our companies will not get the investment they need to grow employment member and boost Griffith wages. Now warned. The member for Fenner, 23rd of October, 2011. If you are helping economic growth, then you are helping the wages of working people. Good for businesses, good for growth, good for jobs and good for wages. That's what a cut in company tax is. Julia Gillard, 15th of March 2012. Really, Mr Speaker, the Labor Party, the Labor Party has now decided that there is no connection between lower company taxes and jobs.
every single Labor Party leader, including the gentleman opposite, has said precisely that. Lower company tax means more investment, more jobs, higher wages, stronger economic growth. Paul Keating set that out in his policy speech in 1993, and, and it was the Leader of the Opposition, the member for Maribyrnong, who 20 years later described Paul Keating as an economic genius for the way he took on the realities of the economy and was prepared in the manner outlined by the member for Grainler to embrace business and recognise that business is the engine room of jobs. The Leader of the Opposition and the Labor Party of today, much to the dismay of the member for Grainler and so many others, has abandoned the very people it was founded to protect. The member for Leichhardt. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for uh, Defence Industry. Will the Minister outline to the House how government is working with industry uh, to support job creation and, invest and investment in the defence industry, and are there, what are the alternatives to supporting jobs and growth in this way? The Minister for Defence Industry. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I thank the member for Leichhardt for his question. Mr Speaker, the government is focused on supporting aspirational Australians. We are focused on securing our nation's defences and, in the process, creating as many jobs as possible—jobs and investment, jobs and growth across the defence industry. And it's working. It's also working in the member for Leichhardt's electorate in particular. To do that, Mr Speaker, we know, we know that we have to cooperate with businesses, large and small. Uh, we know that we have to recognise that not every worker is a member of a union. It's not 1950 anymore, Mr Speaker. And we recognise, of course, that Australians are inherently aspirational, as member they were, Morton, as was understood Morton. by the Hawke Keating government, Mr Speaker. Now, does that sound familiar? It does. Yeah. does that sound a bit familiar? Well, it's all contained, Mr Speaker, in, in, this, in this speech. This is the bloodied dagger, Mr Speaker. <laughs> the bloodied dagger masquerading as a speech from the member for Grain Bluff plunge into the chest of the Leader of the Opposition, Mr Speaker. This is the speech, Mr Speaker, in which the member for Grain Bluff has staked his credentials as the next leader of the Labor Party. Make no mistake, Mr Speaker. He, he is still holding out. He's still pretending that the Labor Party has a place for aspiration in it. He's the Lieutenant Anoda of the Labor Party caucus, Mr Speaker. He's refusing to accept that the Hawke-Keating legacy has been abandoned by the Labor Party. He's darting from one ALP event to another between rubber chicken and party pies and pasties, Mr Speaker, giving a speech here, dropping a column there, trailing his coattails so that the Labor Party know that they have an option in the member for Grandland, Mr Speaker, using the traditional tactics of the guerrilla jungle warrior, Mr Speaker, appearing and then disappearing again. But it's OK. We're not going to let him go. We're not going to let him disappear from view. We're going to make sure the member for Grandless stays front and centre, Mr. Speaker, like a ninja warrior. We're going to make sure that he uh, gets every opportunity to promote his aspirational agenda for the Labor Party, Mr. Speaker. Unfortunately, though, I have bad news for the member for Grandless. The bad news is that the leader of the opposition is not interested in this alternative agenda. He's decided he wants to have a war on business. He wants the CFMEU to be at the cabinet table in a former future Labor government. He wants to reject the aspirations of Australians and also reject the hawk keating legacy. He scoffs at aspiration, Mr Speaker. So I'm, I think it's going to be a long, cold winter for the member for Grandler. And I table this speech, this, this bloody dagger masquerading as an address to the, the Gulf Hitler oration, Mr Speaker. <laughs> I thank the Leader of the House for that. I'm not sure he would have given leave to have it tabled if it was on the other side, but that's the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. In the last month, the Commonwealth Bank was fined $700 million for repeated breaches of anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism financing laws. So why is the Prime Minister this week trying to cut a deal with the One Nation political party to reward the same big banks with a $17 billion handout. 
The Prime Minister has the call. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The, uh, the, the, the major bank levy, of course, uh, demonstrated in uh, last year's budget, demonstrated the government's uh, commitment to ensuring that the banks uh, paid a fair contribution uh, for the protection they have for the implicit guarantee they get from uh, government. Uh, and that's a very, very substantial charge on them. Uh, the case for, for reducing company tax is a case for Australian workers. Every other Labor leader, including the honourable member opposite, has understood this. Uh, the member for McMahon has wrote a whole book about it. The, the fundamental question is one of competitiveness. Do you want Australian businesses to be competitive? If they're not competitive, they won't be successful. In order to be competitive, they have to have a competitive tax rate. Uh, the United States has moved down to 21 per cent. France has gone to 25 per cent. The UK is below 20 per cent. Are we seriously going to maintain the proposition that Australian businesses will be competitive in a global environment with the highest company tax in the OECD? Plainly, every other Labor leader has recognised that. The, uh, the, uh, uh, Paul Keating, the former Prime Minister, uh, said himself, and I'll just conclude with this quote from his 1993 policy speech. He said, he said we lowered the company tax rate from 39 to 33 per cent, providing Australian industry with a business tax system competitive with any in the world, as it was at the time. He went on to say this is where the energy will come from and we'll do everything we can to stimulate it and, where necessary, provide strategic support. Well, that was the Labor Party of Paul Keating and Bob Hawke. The Labor Party of the member for Maribyrnong is one denying economic reality, built on the, po built on the politics of envy and trying to divide Australians rather than unite them. Successful Labor leaders have united Australians and they have done so on the basis of optimism and aspiration. They have not sought to divide them on the basis of envy. The member for Cowper. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Home Affairs. Would the minister advise the House of the importance of strong and consistent measures to secure our maritime boundaries? Is the minister aware of any ideas that could destabilise our strong border protection system? The Minister for Home Affairs. Yeah. Minister for Home Affairs has the call. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I thank the honourable member for his question. And, uh, Mr. Speaker, it's now been 1,429 days since we have not seen a successful boat arrive in this country, and that's a significant achievement. Uh, we've turned back over 30 boats. Uh, the reality is, Mr Speaker, the people smugglers have not gone away. Uh, many of them are lying dormant, I suspect, uh, waiting for the outcome of the next election to see whether or not uh, Mr Shorten is elect whether or not the Leader of the Opposition is elected Prime Minister, and then they will be back into it like there is no tomorrow, Mr Speaker. But I suppose what they're asking themselves is whether or not the member for Grainler will be the leader of the Labor Party by the time of the next election. And, you know, this gratuitous advice being offered uh, in relation to border protection policy and other matters at the moment by the member for Grainler to the member for Maribyrnong, uh, I think I've seen this movie before, Mr Speaker. I seem to recall Mr Rudd as Leader of the Opposition and Leader of the Opposition and Leader in Government putting forward a policy which ended up seeing tens of thousands of people arriving. Remember, he tweaked the policy settings from uh, John Howard when he was in government, and this flood of boats came through. Tragically, 1,200 people drowned at sea. And you remember that Julia Gillard came in, riding in on the white horse, saying, "My way is better. I have an alternative plan. I'll put in place a policy which the Labor Party uh, will be able to put its uh, stock behind." Mr. Speaker, the problem is that for the member for Grainler, he is even softer on border protection than even this Leader of the Opposition. He would be hard to believe, but he would be a bigger disaster than even Julia Gillard, Kevin Rudd, and the Leader of the Opposition chimes in that that's the kindest thing I've ever said about him. Well, it won't be the last if the member for Grainler keeps up, Mr Speaker. 
All I can say, all I can say, Mr. Speaker, is that Graham Richardson had a lot to say about both Julia Gillard and Kevin Rudd, and I noticed he's back in the press again today. I can quote from his article in the Australian, where he says, in part, "With elbow, what you see is what you get." Now, to decode that, that means what you see with the leader of the opposition is not actually what you get. Mr. Uh, Richardson went on to say about elbow, he's not devious and his word is his bond. Now, could that be a coded message about this Leader of the Opposition? I think it is, Mr Speaker. All I can say is we've all sat through the Rudd-Gillard-Rudd Rudd years and watching it from this side, watching it from this side, it's all about to be replayed, Mr Speaker. It's game on again within Labor. The tragedy is that under either this leader or the prospective leader, the boats will the restart time again. Has concluded. The member for Kingston. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. The government's unfair childcare changes start on Monday. Why is this Prime Minister cutting childcare payments for 279,000 families on Monday, including over 2,200 families in Longman, while giving a $17 billion, of $17 billion to the big banks? The Minister for the Environment and Energy. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, I can inform the House that when the Labor Party was last in office, childcare fees went up by 53 per cent, Mr Speaker, 53 per cent. The member for Kingston— And we all remember those 260 childcare— The member for Kingston is warned— price, How many did they deliver? Mr Speaker, just 38, Mr Speaker, the double drop-off. And what about compliance checks? They also went down significantly when Labor was last in office. Now, the Turnbull government's childcare reforms will see nearly one million families better off, Mr Speaker. One million families better off. And those opposite have tried to obstruct it all along, Mr Speaker, even though in the member for Maribyrnong's electorate, 4,800 families will be better off, Mr Speaker. And what about in the member for Kingston's electorate? Over 6,000 families will be better off, Mr Speaker. We will increase the subsidy. For 370,000 families whose income is just over $67,000 a year, will increase the subsidy from 72 to 85 per cent. Mr. Speaker, will encourage more than 200,000 families to re-enter the workforce or to take up greater workforce participation. Mr. Speaker, and the hourly rate caps that was a recommendation out of the Productivity Commission is designed to put downward pressure on fee growth. Mr. Speaker. So at the end of the day, whether you're one of the 3,000 families in Braddon who will be better off under the Turnbull government's childcare, or the more than 7,000 families in Longman, Mr. Speaker, who will be better off under the Turnbull childcare families, always, when it comes to the Labor Party, don't look at what they say. Look what they did, and they put up childcare fees where we are creating more opportunities for families right across the country. The member for Flynn. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of, Envi of Environment and Energy. Will the Minister update the House on how the government's strong economic management ensures an affordable and reliable energy system that benefits families, workers, and small business? Is the Minister aware of any different Members concepts? The Minister for the Environment and Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I thank the Member for Flynn for his question, and he knows that the Turnbull government is focused on delivering lower taxes and lower energy prices, more jobs and more growth and investment. Mr. Speaker. And this is good news for the workers at the Boyne aluminium smelter, good news for the workers at the power stations, the Calide power station, the Gladstone power station, the Stanwell power station across his electorate, the boiler makers, the fitters and turners, the mechanics the engineers, the forklift drivers, the truck drivers, Mr. Speaker, all of whom will benefit from the Turnbull government's economic plan. So you're a fitter and turner in the electorate of Flynn. You're earning $68,000 a year. Under the Turnbull government's tax plan, you will now have an additional $530 a year in your pocket, Mr. Speaker. Over seven years, that's more than $3,700. 
If you're in the electorate in Flynn and you're a workshop manager on an income of $88,000 a year, Mr. Speaker, you will be better off by $570 a year and over seven years more than $4,000 a year better off. And not to mention the energy reforms that the Turnbull government is committed to, which is helping to deliver a drop of nearly 30 per cent in the wholesale prices, Mr. Speaker, and with the ACCC reporting that gas contracts have come down by up to 50 per cent. And retail, retail users, households, businesses, small businesses across the electorates in Queensland, New South Wales and South Australia will, from July 1, start to see their prices fall. And a growing retailer in Australia, PowerShop, just today announced its new prices, Mr. Speaker. Households in, South, in Queensland will see an 8.6 per cent drop, Mr. Speaker. That's worth $140 a year to them. In New South Wales, they'll see a 3 per cent drop, Mr. Speaker. If you are a small business in southeast Queensland, in Brisbane, in the Sunshine Coast or in the Gold Coast, with PowerShop's announcement today, of a 14.6 per cent drop in power prices, Mr. Speaker. This is worth to you more than $1,400, Mr. Speaker. If you're in New South Wales with PowerShop, today, as a result of their announcement, you're a small business, a pie shop, for example, Mr. Speaker, your prices will drop by 8.8 per cent, Mr. Speaker. That's $970 worth to the pie shop owner, Mr Speaker. So, Mr Speaker, we are committed to a more reliable and affordable system. Under the coalition, lower power prices is not just an aspiration, it's a reality. And under the coalition, you'll always pay less for your power bill than you will under Labor. The member for McMahon. Thanks very much, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. The Bank of International Settlements stated overnight that financial vulnerabilities have been rising and that household credit as a ratio to GDP remains at historically high levels in Australia, and that now is the time to rebuild policy buffers. Won't the locking in of long-term tax cuts for big business and high-income earners mean that if a downturn hits, instead of investing in jobs, this government will again cut schools, Medicare and pensions in Australia? The Treasurer has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. A stronger economy. That's what provides the resilience for Australia, Mr Speaker. A stronger economy is what guarantees the essential services that Australians rely on. A stronger economy keeps Australians safe, Mr Speaker. A stronger economy is what takes our budget back into balance and has ensured that in this year net debt turns around and over the next four years net debt will fall by $30 billion and over the next 10 years it will fall by more than $230 billion. A stronger economy is what gets these results. A stronger economy is what gives Australian jobs the resilience they need to ensure they don't lose them in the future, Mr Speaker. I'll tell you what a risk is to the Australian economy, more than $200 billion in higher taxes. That's what the Shadow Treasurer's alternative, his alternative approach to managing the Australian economy is to take an enormous chunk of tax and just throw it on top of the Australian economy and think it will have no impact whatsoever. Higher taxes for small businesses, medium businesses, large businesses, family businesses, higher taxes for retirees, higher taxes on superannuation contributions, higher taxes on housing, higher taxes on investment, higher taxes on personal income tax. He thinks that is the recipe to grow your economy, Mr Speaker. He has no idea. The Minister of Revenue is absolutely right. He's, the Minister of Revenue is absolutely right, Mr. Speaker. More than $200 billion in higher taxes and then lumping another $70 billion on in higher personal income taxes. That's what they're saying to people out in Longman, down in Braddon. They're saying vote Labor and pay more tax. That's the Labor, that's the Labor way, Mr. Speaker. And so if, when it comes to guaranteeing Australians' prosperity in the future, you don't get there by increasing their taxes. I mean, just think through the logic. The Labor Party think that a business, large and small, are going to be more likely to invest if they pay the government more in higher taxes. I mean, just think about that for a second. I'd encourage them to think about that for a second. I mean, how does an Australian business, large or small, compete with a business overseas in France? in the United States, in Tokyo, in London, in Singapore, all of whom are paying lower rates of tax, Mr Speaker, lower rates of tax, 
lower tate rate, we will have the second highest corporate tax rate in the OECD, Mr. Speaker, if we do not pass these these tax changes to make our businesses more competitive. You want to talk about the big end of town? The leader of opposition is supporting the big end of town in the United States, in Paris, in London, in New York, in San Francisco, in Singapore, all over the Western world and further. He is protecting jobs in all of those countries and he's acting against the interests of jobs in this country, Mr. Speaker. The Treasurer's time has concluded. The member for Bonner. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Health. Will the Minister update the House on how a stronger economy enables the government to provide record funding support for health services in South East Queensland? Is the Minister aware of another approach to the funding of health services? The Minister for Health. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the uh, member for Bonner, who, before coming to this place, was very successful in small business and has brought that same hard-working approach to his own electorate of Bonner. One of the things he knew, though, is that you can't be successful in business and you can't be successful in the economy unless you have a plan. And that's why the plan that the Prime Minister and the Treasurer and others have built has helped deliver a million jobs. And those million jobs have helped deliver a budget position which allows us to guarantee essential services, essential services such as record funding for Medicare with an extra $4.8 billion, record funding for hospital with an extra $30 billion over the new long-term hospital agreement, including over an extra $7 billion in Queensland, record funding for mental health and for the PBS. And what we also see is that it allows us at the local level to work on supporting drug and alcohol programs to deal with addiction and to provide hope and opportunity. In his own electorate, he's fought for and been able to secure two important local drug action teams um, with the Blue Light Association and the Schema Action Team. More importantly, even than that, though, is when you look right across Queensland, what you see is a major increase in hospital funding. And this increase goes from what it was under Labor of uh, $2.7 billion in 2012-13 for Commonwealth funding to uh, over $4 billion now and heading to $6.5 billion over the course of the, uh, over the coming years. And what that means is more services, more, uh, more operations and more ability to provide the people of South East Queensland with what they need. But I'm asked whether there are any alternatives. And I saw an online petition on the weekend from Queensland Labor. And what that Queensland Labor petition said was stop the cuts to the Caboolture hospitals. Stop the cuts to Caboolture hospitals. And so I checked the figures, you know, and I, what I found was this that federal funding to the Metro North area, federal funding to the Metro North area that includes Caboolture Hospital went up by $120 million in the last full year alone. $120 million. And yet, the very people who put out this petition about Caboolture Hospital, Queensland Labor, what did they do? They cut their own funding to their own hospital by $21 million. So two things come out of this. One, Labor cannot be trusted. Labor cannot be trusted. And secondly, Labor cannot manage the economy. And if you can't manage the economy, you can't manage health. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you. Uh, my question is to the Prime Minister. Under this Prime Minister, gross debt has crashed through a record half a trillion dollars. Does the Prime Minister agree that Australia has very high levels of debt and very high asset prices? And does the Prime Minister agree that this is the number one domestic risk to our economy? And isn't this the worst possible time to lock in a 10-year, $80 billion business tax giveaway fuelling national debt? Yeah, yeah. The Prime Minister has the call. Speaker, the, the government uh, uh, under the member for Warringah inherited a shocking debt situation from Labor in 2013. We inherited a structural deficit which it has taken years to turn around. Net debt, net debt is peaking this financial year. It has a few days left uh, and will peak as a share of GDP uh, in this current financial year and then decline year on year over the following decade. 
to under 4 per cent of GDP. We have turned the corner on debt. Now, the honourable, the honourable, member, the honourable member referred to uh, asset prices. Let me remind the honourable member that one of the many economic threats he poses to the Australian public and to Australian families is his uh, attack on the savings of retirees, a shocking, shameful assault which is going to force so many of them to sell out of their investments to avoid uh, having the franking credit snatched away from them. And of course, that's not to speak of his campaign against property investment. He's going to increase capital gains tax and abolish negative gearing. Well, the largest single asset class in Australia is residential property. It is already uh, softening. Uh, many people would say that is a correction that was due. Well, it's everything is good in moderation, I suppose. But what do we think the impact of a ban on negative gearing is going to have on a softening residential property market? The Labor Party will smash the savings of Australians. It will smash into the value of the largest single asset class. And you know what, Mr Speaker? That is their avowed intention. The Labor Party is a massive threat to the savings, to the futures, to the prosperity of all Australians. The Leader of the Opposition seeking to table a document. Yes, I seek to table the comments of the Reserve Bank of Australia, Governor Philip Lowe, where he says very high levels of debt and very high asset prices are the number one domestic risk. I just thought the Prime Minister would like to learn. Is leave granted? Leave is not granted. The member for Latrobe. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Small and Family Business, the Workplace and Deregulation. Will the Minister update the House on how the government's plan for jobs and growth will continue to benefit small businesses around Australia? What are the risks to business posed by alternative schemes? The Minister for Small Business. Thank you. Uh, Thank you to Mr Speaker. I thank the member for La Trobe for his passion for small and family businesses in his electorate. Uh, and I note in the Treasurer today, uh, the Prime Minister, we, we revert to headline numbers a lot, but the mechanics sitting behind, so the million jobs, 400,000 in the last 12 months, 80 per cent of those full time, uh, GDP growth of 3.1 per cent, best business confidence conditions since the GFC. Uh, that comes about at the end of the plan that the Treasurer and the Prime Minister and the Minister for Finance have been implementing over the past four and a half years. And what sits behind it at a microeconomic level? A net increase in the number of small and family businesses opening, Mr Speaker, amounting to 158,000 in the last four and a half years. In the member for La Trobe seat, uh, sorry, state of the home state of Victoria, 52,060 small and family businesses have opened, a net increase of that in the past four and a half years. Uh, 20,000 of those in the past 12 months. Of that million jobs, uh, ju just north of a million jobs, 366,000 of those have come from the member of La Trobe's home state, over a third. What is happening, Mr Speaker? At the end of tax cuts, at the end of confidence, comes businesses opening and employing people, businesses reinvesting in themselves, uh, small and family business operators taking on bank debt, backing themselves and employing people. What is the threat to that? Last Friday we saw the latest addition to the CFMEU's uh, record now passed $15.2 million in fines. And the plan, the Leader of the Opposition and his secret deal with the CFMEU puts at risk everything that has been put in place. In the construction sector alone, in the past 12 months, there has been 50,000 jobs created by small and family businesses in Victoria. Yet what does the Leader of the Opposition do as payment to his union mates, beholden to their support for his leadership as well as their financial support for his election campaigns? He wants to take the ABCC, the cop, off the beat, the Building and Construction Commission. As Stephen McBurney, the Commissioner, said to the federal court, in the latest case announced on Friday, the unlawful contact directly threatened the livelihoods of the contractors and their workers. This is what you see. This is what you will see. More of. It is endorsed 
and, and by the Leader of the Opposition. He is beholden to them. We make, must make sure, uh, Mr Speaker, for the sake of the member of La Trobe and small and family businesses in his seat, let alone Victoria and Australia more broadly, that the sensible economic plan of the Turnbull Coalition government is continued to be delivered upon. Otherwise, jobs, workers' jobs, we put at risk. Yeah. The Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper.